Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all as uh, we continue our journey through Second Kings. Um, just a uh, thanks to Larry for teaching last week. I know there was some difficult with the recording, so I'll still work with him on uh, uh, getting that posted for us. So uh, we're continuing uh, with Hezekiah this week. Uh, we got introduced to him last week. Um, but as we get moving, I just want to um, now let's go ahead and open up with the word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings that you pour out upon us. Uh, thank you for your word uh, that brings comfort, that brings restoration, peace, and healing. Lord, we ask that you continue to watch over us and bless us. Be with us today as we study your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so in your groups, what I'd like you to discuss is um, what's your favorite saying, whether it's a quote or a saying or something, what's your favorite saying? Um, and just take a few minutes to talk about that. So uh, we're going to continue with uh, Hezekiah chapter, uh, Hezekiah, it's second Kings chapter 19 and 20. And, and as we do that, um, as we do that, um, I, I ask what your favorite saying is, and, and that might become clear a little later. One of my favorite sayings, one of my favorite quotes um, is from St. Francis of Assisi. Um, and he said uh, something like this, uh, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. <laughs> and I'm like, that's really good. You know, so much of what we do, our life is like a sermon. Our life is like a message that we are constantly preaching and teaching and sharing to others how we live, how we love, um, how we conduct ourselves. Words are necessary sometimes, but... Um, we always are to be living for, for the Lord in everything we do. And I thought that it's been a very powerful one for me uh, in the midst of those things uh, when I think about uh, St. Francis of Assisi and that uh, favorite saying or favorite quote. So today we're going to jump uh, into uh, 2 Kings 19. Super thankful for Larry last week for uh, teaching Bible class for us. Um, but I want to review a little bit just because we kind of left off halfway during the story last week. Uh, there wasn't really a good breaking point in the midst of this. But the, uh, to this point, the northern kingdom of Israel now, what happened last week is Assyria came in and they wiped out the northern kingdom. Right. They uh, they um, they were, uh, we talked about a little bit about their strategies too, of what they did. They would come in and once they conquered a people, they would take most of your people and they would ship them out to another part of their territory, another part of their empire. And they would bring other peoples in from other parts of their empire and have them come and farm and live in your homes and farm your fields and all that kind of stuff. Because uh, what they found was people were far less willing to rebel and defend and try to recapture land that wasn't theirs, right? So if I'm not living, if I have no ties to this land, if it's not my where my great-grandparents lived, I'm much less willing to rebel and fight to reclaim that land because I don't have any ties to it. And so it was a way they would subdue the people. They would mix the cultures up. Um, they would remove your ties to the land and to others through this forced kind of exile and exportation of people. Uh, we had the interesting account where they had to, uh, they brought these new people in and they were worshiping the gods that they used to worship where they came from. And there were all sorts of bad things that were happening and they had to bring a priest of God back into the land to teach them how to worship God properly in that place. Um, and that's where we really get the Samaritans. Um, that's the beginning of the Samaritan people that we find in the New Testament, the odds between the, the Jews and the Samaritans is because we have um, we have Israelites that were left behind intermarrying with people from foreign countries. They have a mixture now of worshiping Yahweh and worshiping of these other gods, a mixture of worship practices and beliefs. Um, and they kind of perpetuate that as it goes on. Uh, sometimes they get close to Judaism, sometimes they don't, um, but that is the beginning of this um, Jewish-Samaritan divide, and it only kind of grows and festers over time. Um, so that's where it begins, is, is right there in that place. So, um, but then we get um, the um, Hezekiah, because of some of the change in leadership in Assyria, decides he's not going to pay a tribute to Assyria anymore. 
Uh, and so they come and try to make an example of Hezekiah and uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And they come in and they, um, they seek to destroy um, Hezekiah. And that's, um, and so uh, and that's, we talked about that a little bit last week as well, but I just want to review by way of some pictures. Some of those were in what you had last week. Some of them weren't, but I just want to um, want to just to kind of explain that in a little more detail um, than maybe we did last week. So, um, so I'm sharing my screen so we can see. All right. And um, I had this picture in the handout from last week. Uh, this is a picture of Lakish. Sometimes people say Lakish. That's what I said until I went over there and everybody said Lakish over there. So now I say Lakish. So um, you can see it's a city on a hill. You can see it's kind of the on top of this mesa, on top of this plateau. Um, and it's uh, the city up there, the city of Lakish. This is one of the fortresses of Judah. And it um, really was, if you're coming from the Mediterranean Sea and you're going up towards the territory of Judah, one of the passes, you know, as you go up into the hill country, goes right by Lachish. One of the valleys goes here. So this was a key strategic city for defense um, and for being able to go out into trade. And so it was very defensible, had a wall around the whole top. One of the cool features of this city is if you notice uh, kind of on the bottom right uh, over here, you'll see this kind of, uh, you'll see the gate kind of protruding out and then a ramp that goes down the hill. You guys follow me on that, this bottom right area here, over here, ramp from down, <laughs> down the hill. So what that meant is if you were an invading army, you had to climb up this hill that ran parallel to the city walls while everybody in the city could throw down rocks and boulders and shoot arrows at you the whole time. Not necessarily a wide uh, road that led up there. And then when you got there, you had a gate that you had to breach. And once you got through that gate, you had to make a right turn, a bottleneck, and breach another gate. So it was very defensible. Um, and so the quiche was a, a, key, um, a key part of um, the defensive situation of Judah. Here's what it looks like today. So I'm standing at the base of that ramp. You can see that where the kind of have built this, oh, there it is, built this ramp that goes up there. You can see that's the ramp that we saw talking about that ran parallel to the wall up above. So they could rain down arrows and everything up above. At the top of that, you can see there's some of it's been eroded away and, and, and whittled away, but there's still the remnants of that gatehouse that's there today. Um, you can see you can go up into the city a little bit too. So Assyria, well, we don't want to do that. That's not going to be good for our people. They would build siege ramps. So what they would do is they would take earth and stones and dirt and debris, and they would pack it up against uh, one side that was not quite as defensible until they had a ramp that they could take up siege weapons to. Um, this is the depiction on the wall of uh, Sennacherib's palace of what he did at uh, Lachish. And so you can see this little thing on the side here, it's got wheels and it's going up this really sharp embankment. That's a picture of how he built siege engines to go up the ramp at Lachish, um, recorded on his walls uh, at his palace. And you can see the, the people of Judah are trying to defend uh, there the tower. Here's another <laughs> picture of that. The, you have the siege weapon that they would go behind as they would go towards the wall, but they'd have to build the ramp to go up there. Um, here's what it looks like today. We still have the remnant part of that siege ramp. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Maybe. All right. But we still can see it today. It'll catch up to us in just a second. There it is. All right. So um, you see the, the rocks, the debris, the dirt, that's the remnants of the siege ramp. The way up on the top, it's hard to see, but they built like where the wall was and where the people would have come to fight against it. Um, so it's the largest siege ramp uh, that's still, that's been excavated to this point. Um, kind of a cool site in Lachish. Um, and we read about that last week, how they were coming against Lachish. And this is where the messengers of uh, Sennacherib are coming from when they reach Hezekiah. They're coming from Lachish as they encamp the city. 
And Assyria was even more brilliant and brutal at the same time because they wouldn't have their own soldiers build the siege ramp. They would have the people they captured from the previous town build the siege ramp. So most likely they're your cousins or relatives or your, your wife's husband that is building this siege ramp. And if they don't, they'll be killed. And if you let them, you're going to be killed. But otherwise, you have to kill. You know, so it's just uh, they're caught in a really stuff place. Um, and so, uh, what we read in Second uh, uh, Kings chapter eighteen, verse thirteen, uh, in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So we saw Lachish. That was an example of one of the fortified cities. So this map that's on the screen here. Um, should be kind of familiar to us by now, right? We can see where the Dead Sea is. We know Jerusalem's about a third of the way towards the Mediterranean Sea from there, all right? And we know that the territory of Judah is, is there, but it's shrunk now because Sennacherib has taken all the fortified cities. It's really shrunk to Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and, and the area right around them. It's really almost a city-state at this point, not really a whole kingdom. Because Sennacherib, what has he done? He's destroyed and captured all the fortified cities. And yes, people might have fled from there before he came. And so Jerusalem might be swelling with refugees at this point. Um, but Judah um, at this point is struggling uh, to, for survival. Uh, and basically Sennacherib sends his messengers. We heard about that last week. He sent the messenger to, to Hezekiah saying, why are you guys even trying anymore? Just give up Hezekiah, give up your city. We won't kill you all. You won't have your city anymore, but we'll give you a new land and a better land. It'll be good. You'll still be alive. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Don't think that he can save you, right? That was what the message said. And don't trust in your God. What's that going to do, right? That was the message of Sennacherib's, um, from Sennacherib to Hezekiah. And that's where we really ended last week, um, as we talked about um, this war that's going on. All right, any questions on that so far? And where is Hezekiah? Hezekiah is in Jerusalem. Hezekiah is in Jerusalem. Uh, Lake Asher Lachish, if you go southwest from Jerusalem, uh, it's this farther dot right over, I think it's my mouse moving, it's that dot right over there. And so it, it's maybe about um, 10 miles from Jerusalem. 10 to 15 miles, maybe, maybe, maybe 20, no more. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Hezekiah, good king or bad king? Do you remember? Good king. He did a lot of reforms and he opened the temple worship back up. Um, he undid a lot of things that his father Ahaz had done, who had done a lot of wicked things, uh, but a good king. But still, bad things are going on even during his reign. Is that picture the ring that goes up to Jerusalem? Lachish. Oh. Lachish, Lachish, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jerusalem. No, not, not Jerusalem. That was, um, but they had done those ramps probably at all the other fortified cities too. Yeah. And they were coming to Jerusalem next. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, but that depiction of that siege ramp with the siege weapon, that was found back in Assyria. <laughs> this one or this one? I'm oh, sorry, it's not catching up. Not that, that's the, that's the, those two. Those are the pictures of the siege ramp that uh, that Sennacherib. This was the this was the regular ramp going up, yeah. And then this one, this one um, coming up. That's the regular ramp. Sorry, it's catching up. Um, this one. Where it's the angle this way with all the rubble and debris, that's the remnants of the sea tramp. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, can somebody read for us? Let's have somebody in the room read for us um, 
2 Kings 19, verses 1 through 7. I've got the microphone so we can make sure we hear that online as well. 2 Kings. As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth with the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Thank you so much. So uh, Hezekiah, he hears these words, these threatening words that are delivered by uh, Sennacherib's messenger, the Rabshaka. This is a, a position. It's like the voice or the mouthpiece of the king. Right. And so he has come to proclaim and mock Hezekiah, proclaim they'll be destroyed and to mock the living God. Hezekiah, what does he do? Um, he um, puts on sackcloth, which is a sign of repentance and humility. And he goes into the temple and he prays. Um, and he also at the same time, he sends messengers to Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah is the prophet uh, at this time. And he's looking for God's response. Isaiah is, or uh, Hezekiah is looking to Isaiah, the Lord's mouthpiece, the Lord's representative, to what God will say about this calamity, about these words that have insulted and mocked God. What will God do in this instance? So uh, what, what does Hezekiah mean by the word remnant in verse four? Did you catch that? He says, um, therefore, lift up your prayers for the remnant that is left. Who's he talking about? So the remnant are those living in Jerusalem, because what happened to the rest of Judah so far? They've been captured, destroyed, some captured, some destroyed, right? The remnant are those that are still living in Jerusalem, because there's not much else, uh, other safe places in Judah at this point, and even Jerusalem's not safe. Um, they're beginning to be besieged by Assyria. All right, um, because as we look back in, in uh, 18 verse 13, all the other cities of Judah have been sacked. They've been destroyed. Lachish is one of those we just talked about, right? Um, and so what's Isaiah's answer? How does Isaiah answer, um, answer Hezekiah? Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid because of the words you have heard, right? Don't be afraid. Here's what's going to happen. He's going to hear a word, a rumor. And he's going to return to his own land, and there he will be killed. Don't be afraid of this king, this man. He'll, he'll fall by the sword there in his own land. What's interesting is that if you look back at 18 verse 20, one of the, the messages to the, the, the voice or the mouthpiece of um, Sennacherib said is, uh, say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy, are in power for war? Right? Do you think that mere words will save you, Hezekiah? Right? And what does uh, Isaiah say will save him? A rumor. Mere words will, will save him, right? And so uh, when they... It's kind of irony in the midst of this. Um, with mere words, God overturns Sennacherib, the very thing that his messenger was mocking Isaiah or Hezekiah for trusting in, the words of the Lord. Um, this is what saves him, mere words, 
Um, so um, as we thought about favorite sayings, maybe that kind of ties together a little bit. Yeah. Words have power. Uh, they did then and they do today. Yes, armies have power. Yes, uh, uh, there is might and strength. But the mere words of our Lord are even stronger. And, and that's really what we'll see throughout our study today. Um, and so where do we go to hear God's words in time of distress? Where, where is it that we go? The Bible. Where else? Church. So our memories of what we've been taught, those things that we've memorized, that we've learned, that we've heard. Um, you know, I, um, Hezekiah went to the prophet, right? A prophet is one who speaks for God. We go to our pastors too, don't we? That, that office of prophet today, the ones that speak for God. Um, when, time, when we have times of distress, sickness, loss, often we turn to our pastors looking for a word from the Lord in that moment. Um, a word of comfort, a word of peace, a word of explanation. And sometimes we can give a clear word of explanation. Sometimes we don't, but we can still give a word from the Lord of comfort and peace in those times. But it's, yeah, it's, it's God's word. It's his church. It's the community of believers. It's our pastors. It's those things that we've been taught and, and have uh, learned. Those mere words that God has given to us, but still, just as they did then, still today have power. All right. Uh, let's keep going on. We'll go ahead and read this next section. Um, and the Rabshaka returned and found the king of Assyria fighting at Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. Libna is just another ter- uh, city in Judah, just a little bit towards the north and to the east, the north and to the east of, uh, of Lachish. Um, now the king had heard concerning Turka, king of Cush. Behold, he has sent out to fight against you. So he sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them? The nations that my fathers destroyed, Goz and Haran, Repsa, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar, where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sefer, Sefer-Grim, the king of Hena, the king of Evna, Eva? Why does, uh, why does the king of Assyria tell Hezekiah he has no hope? Hezekiah, you have no hope. Look at history. No nation, no king, no god has ever withstood me and my people. You have no hope. No one can withstand us. And he's right. Up until this point, no one has withstood Assyria, which is why he's coming after Hezekiah, because Hezekiah decided not to pay tribute. Hezekiah then saw him, all the cities being destroyed, so he pays tribute. Um, But they're going to make an example of Hezekiah. They're going to kill him. No one stands up against us. If they don't kill Hezekiah, what are they afraid they're going to look like? They're going to look weak. They're going to look like, oh, if Hezekiah doesn't have to pay tribute, why should we? Right? And so their policy, their history, their track record, Hezekiah is is done. No one's ever withstood him. (laughs) Basically, the message is here. Uh, Surrender, destroy, Hezekiah, at least you can save your people. All right, that's that's the message. That's what's going on here. All right. Um, He hears this word, uh, it's this word from the king of of Cush, right? He hears that maybe there's an army coming out of Egypt. So he presses uh, Hezekiah, maybe thinking that he's going to have reinforcements coming. So he presses Hezekiah uh, in the midst of this. Egypt's not coming. Um, They don't come. Um, in the midst of this time. Um, but the king hears a word, right? Mere words are getting him to be a little agitated and, and push the timeline a little bit. All right. Uh, can somebody read for us 14 through 19? Anybody want to do that? Yeah. Thank you, Doris. 14 through 19. Hezekiah's response here with this another letter that he received from Sennacherib, king of Syria. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. 
And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, and throne above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, for all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For if they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they were destroyed. So now, Lord our God, save us, please, from this hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. All right, thank you. So um, what is, how does Hezekiah respond? He literally takes the letter and lays it out in the temple. He brings it to church and lays it out, unfolds it, before the Lord and says, Lord, you know all things. You know the words of this letter. What are we to do? <laughs> right? You are the only God. You are God above all gods. But what are we to do? And he asks for deliverance. He goes to the Lord. He gives the problem to the Lord and asks for deliverance because he knows he can't solve the problem. How is that a good reminder of what we should do when we're in distress? Pray for guidance. Pray for guidance. Bring it before the Lord, right? We lay it before the Lord. Lord, I can't solve this problem on my own. You already know it. You already know what will be. Lord, it help. <laughs> I can't do it. Deliver, protect, preserve. Um, interesting, right? God can defend his name, right? The, uh, the king of Assyria is attacking the name of the Lord. He's protecting the reputation of the Lord. Your God has no power. Hezekiah says, God, you know what he's saying about you. And, and you can defend your name. You have power here. Um, and I think the important thing, Hezekiah probably felt very alone. <laughs> probably felt very isolated. Um, but as he went to the Lord the reminder there that he's not alone, that we're not alone in our struggles and the conflict and distress, that God is always with us too, no matter what that outcome would be. All right, so God answers. God answers Hezekiah's prayer, and he does so through the prophet Isaiah. Um, Isaiah comes to him and speaks for God, right? That's what prophets do. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, verse 20, sent to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word of the Lord that has spoken concerning. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. And then he goes into this. It's, it's more of a prophecy than it is like a direct dialogue. And so there's symbolic language and there's points of view. So I want to make sure we understand what we're talking about here. It says she despises you. Who despises you? So God's talking. And it says, she despises you. So talking to Hezekiah, it's Hezekiah, it's Jerusalem, it's, it's Judah. So who is the she? The people of Assyria, the nation of Assyria. So, mine says the virgin daughter of Zion. so she despises you, <laughs> the virgin daughter of Zion. So the you, the virgin daughter of Zion refers to the you. And you, is you is the people, yeah, the virgin daughter of Zion, which is Judah, Jerusalem. Uh, Zion is the hill on, is, is another name for the hill on which Jerusalem is built on. So again, this is picture language uh, and when you get into prophecy like this. So what he's saying is Assyria despises you, O virgin daughter of Zion. She who wages war, wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, you people of Jerusalem, the city Assyria despises you, Jerusalem, right? That's what's going on. Um, and then God changed. So the first paragraph or the first verse there, that's directed to Jerusalem, to the people in Jerusalem. Now God is still the speaker, but he's changing his direction of his voice. 
Now in verse 22, he is talking to Assyria, to Sennacherib. All right, so here's what God says to Sennacherib. Whom, you have, whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights against the Holy One of Israel? By your messengers, you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, with my many chariots, I have gone up to the heights and the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon. I have felt its tallest cedars, the choicest cypresses. I entered its farthest lodging place, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters. I dried up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. God's still now in this next section. So... So that was the, God was saying, this is the, the arrogance of Assyria, right? He's describing that. Now God again speaks to Assyria. Have you, not, have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruin, while their inhabitants shorn of strength are dismayed and confounded, and have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops blighted before its growth. And again, he is talking to Sennacherib in Assyria. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and coming in and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me and your complacency has come into my ears, I will put my hook in your nose, into my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. So you see this picture language, um, <clears throat> what's going on. God answers Hezekiah's prayer. He's not done. He's still got more. But in this, uh, he does it through Isaiah, through this prophecy, that God is not like other gods. God is not made of stone or wood. God is the one who ordained, determined, is using you, Sennacherib. You are his instrument. He has ordained your days. He has allowed you this conquest. And he's going to turn you away from it again. Um, God knows everything the king of Assyria does. When you rise, when you sit down, when you go, what you're thinking. I will turn you back. That's what God says to the king of Assyria um, in the midst of all of this. And as we look at this, uh, we can see how God answers Hezekiah's prayer. He's praying for deliverance, and he sends a messenger. He sends a prophet. When we struggle, how does God answer our prayers? It's kind of the same answer we talked about before, isn't it? Through his word, through Jesus, and through his messengers today. <clears throat> through his pastors and teachers and other Christians God sends his message to us again today to answer those prayers. That's how he does it, through his word, um, and just as he's always done. All right, any questions on that prophecy before we get on to the rest of Hezekiah's, or Isaiah's answer to Hezekiah? Saw how I unpacked that prophecy. It's a little bit more flowery language, a little more picture language, and it's important, like, who's he talking to at right now? makes a difference to how we understand what's going on. But hopefully that, that became clear as I walked through that with you. All right, and then in verse 29, I'll go ahead and keep reading here. This is still Isaiah talking. Now it's more direct discourse. He's still talking for the Lord uh, to Hezekiah. And this shall be the sign for you. This year, eat what grows of itself. And then the second year, what springs of the same. Then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way of that he came, by that same way he shall return. And he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. 
And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, there were all, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. And he, and as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his god, Adramalek, and Shazi, Sharazar, uh, his sons, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Asar, Sarhadon, his son, reigned in his place. So his own son? Own sons killed him. Right. And we can talk maybe a little bit about why in a minute. Um, so God says he will defend the city. Uh, why does God say he will defend the city? For his own name's sake, not for your sake, Hezekiah, not for, for my name's sake, because I am faithful, because I am who I say I am. I am Yahweh. I am who I am for my name's sake and because of my promise to David. Right. I will save the city. Um, and how does he do it? Um, oh, so you get the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. Right. So second commandment. Right. Um, is uh, the. Um, don't misuse God's name. First petition of the Lord's Prayer is, hallowed be thy name. They're related, right? Um, anybody remember Luther's explanation to the second or first petition off the top of their head? All right. It goes something like this. Um, God's name is certainly kept holy, even without our prayers. But we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. Right. God's name is certainly holy, even without our prayers. Right. Are we going to do anything to make God's name holy? No. All right. Our actions don't make God's name holy or not. But what we're praying for is that by our actions, by our words, by what we do, that we would act and treat it as holy among us. That's what we're praying for. And here, does God protect his own name? Yeah, does Hezekiah didn't do anything to defend God's name? No, God's got it covered. Right. But what Hezekiah is doing is he's keeping God's name holy. He's going to the Lord in prayer. He's, you know, um, asking for God's help and deliverance. He's using God's name in the way that God wants him to. Right. Um, that's in line with that first petition. Hallowed be thy name. Right. That's what's going on uh, there. <laughs> All right. So and then we hear about how the Lord actually does this. Right. The Lord goes out and strikes down one hundred and eighty five thousand in the camp. Uh, if you've been in Bible class with me before, uh, sometimes when we see these big round numbers, um, we kind of wonder at them a little bit. Um, 185,000, the word for thousand in Hebrew can mean a literal thousand. But it also can mean a, uh, it's also a term for a military unit. So it could just mean a unit that's there. So either way, whether it's 185,000 soldiers or 185 military units, is that a big number? Yeah. So probably on the low end, we're talking anywhere from 20,000 to 185,000. Should that cause us concern, depending on which way that's kind of what number that is? No, is God still doing a major, huge miracle here? Yeah. And I, I tend to, yeah, some of these numbers, we just don't know. Uh, but it's, it's a huge number of soldiers that are killed by the Lord. All right. Um, and so then Sennacherib goes home. He hears about some stuff that's going home. As he goes home, though, does he go home empty-handed? Not at all. So Sennacherib, does he kill Hezekiah? Does he destroy Jerusalem? No, and this is not only, uh, this is a, um, this is an event. So he goes home and he records his plunder of Judah, how he destroyed all the other cities. It's recorded for us and we can still read about it today. But uh, historians, people that study this part of history, the big question that they ask is, well, why didn't Hezekiah, or why didn't Sennacherib destroy Jerusalem too? This doesn't happen anywhere else in their history, right? Why did he let Hezekiah live? It's a huge debated question amongst historians because most of them think that the biblical account isn't reliable, that the biblical account is just kind of uh, 
fanciful religious kind of propaganda. And they, but they have attested in history from Sennacherib's own voice that he didn't destroy Jerusalem. So here's Sennacherib, powerful, most powerful ruler on the face of the planet. He returns home and he writes about it. And is he going to write, hey, I got kind of whooped by some unknown force. Right. That's going to leave him open. Right. To what his sons actually end up doing. Right. Because people close to him know, but he goes and he writes on these murals. He depicts his siege of Lachish and how he destroyed these fortified cities. And he describes all of the plunder and all of the uh, magnificence of what he brought back from Judah. Here's how he describes it. We actually have that written down for us. It, it's, uh, he says, as to Hezekiah the Judean, he did not submit to my yoke. <coughs> Excuse me. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities, walled forts, and to the countless small villages in their vicinity, and conquered them by means of well-stamped earth ramps and battering rams brought thus near to the walls, combined with the attack by foot soldiers using mines, breaches, as well as sapper work. I drove out of them 200,000, 200,000, 150, 200,150 people, young and old male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, big and small, cattle beyond counting, and considered them booty himself, talking about Hezekiah. I made a prisoner in Jerusalem in his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthwork in order to molest those who were leaving his city gates. His towns, which I plundered, I took away from his country and gave them over to Mitanni, king of Ashdod, Paddy, king of Ekron, and Silabel, king of Gaza. Thus I reduced his country, but I still increased the tribute and presence due to me as his overlord, which I imposed later upon him beyond the former tribute to be delivered annually. Uh, it's written in the, some of the, uh, the chronicles of the annals of the kings of Assyria. Not in the Bible. This is outside of the of scripture. This is how he describes this event, right? And so the mystery for historians is, why? Why did Sennacherib not destroy Jerusalem and Hezekiah? Right? You, you heard the bragging in history or in uh, scripture, right? I've destroyed these cities, these kings, their God could not save them. Historians are like, well, what happened? Why did he go home without destroying Jerusalem? Because they, again... To them, the Bible is not real high. But here we have this account in uh, Assyrian history that lines up very well with our, uh, our history that we have in the scripture, isn't it? It's how, exactly how we think this person would write it, putting the best spin on it to make himself look really good. And he said, oh, and yeah, by the way, we lost 185,000 troops before we came home. Right? He doesn't put that on, the, on any inscription. He doesn't depict that in the, the walls, right? Because on the walls, he, he had the, the siege ramps, but he also had depictions of all of the plunder he brought back from Israel and Judah. No, Sennacherib did not. He, no, he, and we wouldn't expect him to, would we? No, he didn't include that event. There are two other historians that talk about this event, one a couple hundred years later, um, and the details are a little different. Um, he talks about it being in Egypt, um, but it's a, a Greek historian named uh, Herodotus, Herodotus um, where he talks about how Sennacherib um, was defeat, his army was defeated by mice. And so he was not able to destroy Egypt. And to our knowledge, there's not ever a record of Sennacherib going to Egypt. And so it could be a place of uh, mice. Yeah, if there is, I'm not aware of it. But um, Josephus, Josephus also talks about. Yeah, there's some different things that way. Yeah, not. Yeah. 
Yeah, Josephus, um, he's a, the, a Jewish historian in the first century, or uh, lived during the time of Paul. Um, he records this event, and he talks about how they were, de they were defeated by mice. Now, some say it was like they ate through the sandal straps and their bows, so they weren't ready to fight and couldn't defend themselves. Um, some have suggested maybe that's a plague, right? So the details aren't 100% synced. But even other historians outside of scripture, does it really line up mostly with what scripture says? Some supernatural thing caused Assyria not to defeat Jerusalem? Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, I was reading an article about this, and this is what this historian said, right? Not trying to defend the script, pages of scripture, just trying to solve this mystery, which to us isn't a mystery. We know what happened. Um, but he said, at the end of the day, it had to be uh, a calamity or something like it that struck the Assyrian camp and the Assyrians had to break off the campaign. That is the only feasible explanation why the Assyrians didn't conquer Jerusalem. They were simply incapable. To deliberately show leniency to rebels would have made Sennacherib look weak, right, resulting in more uprisings. So he was not able to do it. So he went home. He tried to put a good spin on it. He tried to depict that this is exactly what he wanted to do, and it, it was better. Um, and some have suggested it's because of this very event, uh, because he wasn't able to do this, that his two sons kill him because he's weak and they think he's vulnerable. And then a third son becomes king. All right. Um, so that's kind of fascinating. I, I, I love the history of this. I love the there. But in, in the midst of it, what do we see? We see God and his work, his words, undoing the most powerful king on earth. Cannot stand up to the word, the might, the power of God. He's undone by them. And what an awesome uh, thing that our God does and protects here for uh, for Hezekiah. But again, we're not surprised by this as students of scripture and, and what God has done. And this is not the first time that the angel of the Lord has caused destruction for the, the saving of his people. We think of the, the Passover, where it's the angel of the Lord that goes through Egypt and kills the firstborn. Um, or we think of um, the the angel of the Lord that fights for fights for um, the people, competes with Joshua, um, brings down the walls of Jericho. All of these kind of things where we get the where God works for His people, a time and time and time again. Um, uh, it's the angel of the Lord, by the way, um, that is um, when David sins at the end of his life. And there's a plague or a pestilence or a, a death that comes on the people of Israel because of David's arrogance. It's the angel of the Lord that goes through all of Israel and comes to Jerusalem and about to destroy and kill people there um, when the Lord relents uh, as David prays and offers sacrifices to him there. So it's just kind of interesting that the power the angel of the Lord has. Um, God has this power to, to kill and to keep alive and, and uses this in a powerful way in this way. All right, any questions on chapter 19 in this episode with Hezekiah in Assyria? We still have another episode with Hezekiah. This is uh, probably one that might be uh, more familiar with the Sunday school lesson and other things like that. But before we get to that lesson, that section, is there anything with Hezekiah um, and Assyria, any of the history with uh, Sennacherib and those kinds of things? So there's that one. Uh, there is things about Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah. Um, uh, in fact, this next, um, the end of chapter 20 uh, from like verse 12 on um, is almost identical to chapter 39 in Isaiah. Um, and so there's, there's some of these prophecies, some of these things are there. Um, but there's some, yeah, some of these things are in I, Isaiah as well. And then there's more about Hezekiah in Second Chronicles as well. Um, it talks about sometimes he struggled with pride and arrogance, and we're going to see that um, as we come up, um, but he still was faithful to the Lord, um, even though he didn't get everything right. Reminds us of us, right? <laughs> we try to be faithful, and we don't get everything right in the midst of that, too, right? Any other questions on, on Hezekiah and Assyria? 
Uh, Syria still remains a dominant power for a while, but this is kind of the beginning of the end. They don't really spread their wings much farther than this. Uh, and they are um, a country that or a region that they'd previously conquered um, begins to rise up at this time. And we'll talk about that at the end of the next chapter. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of the end for Assyria um, at this time. So, all right, any, any other questions on that? All right, let's go ahead and um, Yeah, let's go ahead and read. Um, somebody can read for us uh, this next account. Um, 2 Kings 20, verses 1 through 11. You got it, Elaine? Thank you. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and had Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to Thus said the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, Lord, I pray, how have I walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what is good in your sight, and has kind of wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me, that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Then Isaiah said, this is a sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward, forward 10 degrees and go backward 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down on the sundown of the hands. All right, thank you so much. All right, so as we, as we look at this, Hezekiah becomes sick, uh, and it's a serious, serious uh, illness here um, that uh, is, should, is probably going to lead to his death. And Isaiah comes and tells him just that. Um, so Isaiah says, put your affairs in order, you're going to die. Um, and I, Hezekiah does again what he does when he's in distress and trouble. He prays to the Lord. He asks for deliverance. He pours out his heart to the Lord. He humbles himself. Um, I, I told you earlier, we learn and in, in see in um, Second Chronicles, doesn't necessarily name specific things, but he struggled with pride. Um, but he humbles himself before the Lord. Um, and Isaiah is sent back and told he'll receive 15 more years. And he says, the Lord will give you a sign. Which way do you, do you want the shadow to jump forward 10 steps or do you want it to go backward 10 steps? And Hezekiah is like, well, it always goes forward 10 steps. Just the way the sun uh, and, and, that, and, the, cat and the, the way the sun hit the steps and the <laughs> stairs in this specific place in the palace, it always goes forward. I want it to go backward 10 steps. And so that's exactly what happens. Uh, the sun moves backwards. Um, here, there's a miracle in this, and um, it goes the wrong direction. And Isaiah gets exactly that. He gets uh, fifth, or Hezekiah gets 15 more years. Again, God healing him through the prophet Isaiah, um, showing him there. And so that mixture of figs, that, that, that's not the remedy, right? We saw um, in Elisha, he would use common everyday things as a sign or a symbol of the heal of the what he did um 
or he, he would throw something in the water to make the ax head float, or he threw something in the stew to, to heal the stew. He used water to heal Naaman, right? Um, he used a, a common everyday thing to, to be a sign for the healing. And that's what's going on here. Now, this is how our God works. He uses common everyday things tied to his word to bring us extraordinary things like forgiveness of sins and salvation and um, through the sacraments and the water and his word. All right. Any questions on this, um, this section here? So the sign was physically that the sun went backwards so that the shadow. The sun went backwards, which caused the set shadow to move the wrong <laughs> way on this. We, we've seen that, right? If you watch the sun go down, it moves across and creeps across the ground or across stairs. It's now going the wrong way. Um, and that's, that's the sign. God does an extraordinary miracle to show that he will be healed and have 15 more years of life. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So let's, um, let's keep moving on. Um, I'll go ahead and finish up here. At that time, Merodach Baladin, son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oils, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah, the prophet, came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? And from where did they come uh, to you? And Hezekiah said, they have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. And there is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who shall be born to you shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not? If I, there will be peace and security in my days. The rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Yeah, yeah Manasseh was not a good guy. So, all right. So what does Hezekiah show the envoys from Babylon? Um, so... He had given away some of it back, but there's still always. Yeah. Yeah, he gave, gave from the temple and, and things, but there's still storehouses and there's still revenue coming in. So things still come in at this time. So he shows him all of this stuff. He shows him everything, right? And Isaiah says, everything that you've shown him, Babylon will take away in the future. And Hezekiah's reaction is almost a little odd, isn't it? Well, that's good. At least it won't happen while I'm alive. He's a little short-sighted, right? But he's like, I'm going to have peace and security. This is good, right? Um, a little short-sighted. Well, I got 15 more years. It's going to be peace and prosperity for 15 years. Life's good. So a little short-sighted in the midst of all of this, right? A little bit of a, um, like I said, uh, a little bit of pride that we see at work here too, right? Because why did the uh, why did the prince of Babylon come? Because he'd heard Isaiah or Hezekiah had been sick and recovered. He probably also had heard what? Hezekiah, you were marked for death, and you, you didn't. They didn't kill you. He probably wants to figure out and hear what's going on about the whole the siege and um, Sennacherib going home. Right. And what does he show him? Hey, look at all my wealth. <clears throat> look at all of this that I have. 
what probably maybe, and this is just conjecture here at this point, but what maybe should have been his response? Hey, let me tell you about my God. Yeah, there's a lot of wealth here, but, but man, the real wealth that we have is in our God, right? That's what they're supposed to be, a kingdom of priests, a light to the nations, right? Is he doing that? Doesn't, doesn't seem to be. His pride seems to be getting in the way a little bit. Right. Um, so um, and so his his reign, um, Isaiah prophesies that your reign will come to your kingdom will come to an end, not under your leadership, but eventually under the leadership of your sons. And about this point in time, um, it's around 700 when Hezekiah is confronted with the Syria. He reigns for about 15 more years, um, about 100 years later is the, the destruction, the downfall of Judah. And so Isaiah is writing, and some of the things that he's prophesying and writing during this time, he's writing to those exiles that are coming 100 years from now. Jerusalem, you're going to be destroyed. And this is comfort to comfort for those that are away from Jerusalem. Do you think that was a popular message? Not so much. Because they were sitting safe and secure at that point in Jerusalem. God had just saved them from Sennacherib. Hey, you guys, as a people, you have not turned away from all these things that you need to. Not a popular message from Isaiah. All right. Uh, what does Hezekiah build? Did you catch that? A wall. He brought water into the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in Chronicles, right? In Chronicles, if you go there and read about it, it talks how he blocked up, diverted the water brought it into the city. It also talks about the, the broad wall, the, the city wall that he built and defended and made bigger around that. What's cool um, is if you go to Jerusalem today, you can see the conduit that Hezekiah built. You can actually walk through that waterway and you can see part of the broad wall, a very small part, but you can still see part of the wall that he made. All right. So this is... Um, this picture that will catch up here in just a second. <laughs> it's not coming up. You're a little slow today. Um, maybe we'll get there. All right. So um, you have in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, uh, you guys have seen pictures of the Temple Mount before. It's got the big gold dome of the rock on top of it. Um, if you, um, that's the, what's called the old, it's part of the old city. It's where the Temple of Solomon was built. Uh, that's where Hezekiah would go. If you go to the, the left of that, to the south of that, um, you can see um, you're actually in the old city of David, <laughs> what they call the city of David, which is um, where the city started. It's actually not in the old city walls. It's older. It's outside of it. And as you look down, I'm standing on kind of a, a building, a platform here that's built in this old city. You can see that it goes sharply down to the left. Can you guys see that there? Um, or sorry, down to the right. No. Go to the left. Yeah. Turn around. So we're sharply down to the left, right? Uh, correct. Um, and it angles down a little bit to the, the other side too, right? But it also angles down away from me. It's a little spur of a, of a mountain that comes out here. And on this was the old city of David. And you can see even today there are homes and things built all and tucked in here, right? And so you can imagine this is where if David's on his rooftop and he's looking down, he could see into the courtyard of somebody else and sees Bathsheba taking a bath. You can kind of picture that. So here's the struggle. Uh, the wall in Hezekiah's day ran along this left barrier over here and down and around to the point of that. And then it, it, cut, to the, it cut to the left. The right, excuse me, and, and came up and around and then came up and connected to the Temple Mount, All right? Here's the problem. The main source of water was the Gihon Spring, and it had some fortifications around it, but it was actually outside the city gates, city wall proper. So if you have an, an evading army coming, surrounding you and besieging you, you would be in danger of not only giving them a great water supply, but being cut off from your water supply. And so what Hezekiah does as Sennacherib um, comes and starts to destroy the towns of Judah around him, 
they stop up the other wells that are around. They kind of cap this well and divert it underneath the mountain to the other side inside the city proper. Right. Um, and this uh, waterway, they hew and hack from both sides to till they meet in the middle. But again, they're just using gravity, so it has to be a little slight grade downhill to get the water from the Gihon Spring to their pool that they're building. And so that's what they do. Um, and there's a, a picture of the the tunnel. Can you, walk you can walk through that. My shoulder, my shoulders are touching both sides. Here's, uh, I think you must have been farther back, Wenda, because I got Bill and uh, Martha in there. But uh, um, so my shoulders are touching both sides. I got some headroom here. Um, there were spots I had to duck. Martha did not have to duck. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, but it, what you can see, it's not straight. So they dug from both sides and it curved around and it's like they tried to go a couple ways and like, oh, that's not gonna work. And, and they're not exactly sure how they did it, even to this day. The best guess is that they did soundings from above. They were like, would bang on stuff from above to get it sent down. And they maybe were getting too deep. So they had to cut back where it wasn't, where they could hear better. Um, just interesting. There are parts where it's really high, where it's like, oh, we started too high, we have to bring it even lower. And there are parts that just work just right. Um, this, um, up until the mid 1800s, um, most people thought, oh, that's just a myth. That didn't really happen. This is something they're just including detail in there that's not really true. But in the 1800s, there's this guy named Edward Robinson who writes this. He says, he and a friend, in 1838, he and a friend crept through the tunnel, yet in several places we could only get forward by line at full length and dragging ourselves on our elbows. And then about 30 years later in 1867, Captain Charles Warren, who was uh, doing a lot of excavation in this area, he said, uh, we made uh, partway through, however, the spring unexpectedly gushed. 800 feet into the tunnel, the passage was only one foot, 10 inches high. And here's what he says. And here our troubles began. The water was running with great violence, one foot in height, and we crawling uh, full length. We're, we're up to it, our necks in it. I was particularly embarrassed, one hand necessarily wet and dirty, the other holding a pencil, compass, and field book, the candle for the most part in my mouth, and another 50 feet brought us to the place where we had regularly uh, to run the gauntlet of the waters, the passage being only a quarter inch high or one foot, four inches high. We had just four inches breathing space and some difficulty in twisting our necks around properly when observing my mouth was underwater. Just here, I voluntarily swallowed a portion of my lead pencil for a minute or two. We were nearly four hours in the water. So what had happened is the it's not that Hezekiah never built the tunnel, but over years, it had kind of gotten forgotten about as the destruction of Jerusalem and other things. And silt and debris built up into this tunnel. And so it was rediscovered in the 1800s, just like Hezekiah, or describes Hezekiah doing this in Kings and in Chronicles. And when they uh, kind of, uh, Warren kind of began to clean out some of this debris, they found an inscription in the middle of the, of this waterway, of this tunnel. And it's called, uh, it, and, it, and this is what it, the inscription says. Um, I believe it's in Turkey today, because that's what you used to do is if you went and you had an excavation, you took everything back to your own country. So I believe it's in Turkey today. And this inscription that was on the wall. The matter of the breakthrough. And this is the matter of the breakthrough. While the hewers were swinging their at the axe each toward his companion, and while there were still three cubits, a cubit's 18 inches, right? So we're talking about a yard and a half uh, to hew. There was heard the voice of a man calling to his companion because there was a fissure in the rock and the, on, on the right and on the left. And on the day of, the break, of its breakthrough, the hewers struck each man towards his companion, axe toward axe, and the waters flowed from the outlet to the pool. 
1,200 cubits. It's about 900 feet, I think. And 100 cubits was the height of the head, the rock above the heads of the hewers, right? So about five feet, five, you know, five, six feet. So they were swinging axes at each other going and they finally broke through and they put an inscription and plaque on there, um, you know, detailing that event. Uh, and if you walk through, if you're uh, observant, you can see that there's a little, the blades on the side where they're going more curved this way. And then when you get far enough through, they, they begin to curve the other way. As you see those ax marks going the different directions. Pretty cool. Um, and it runs out into this pool. Uh, they've excavated part of it. Part of it is still private land, so They haven't excavated the other part of it uh, where this would come. They, at the end of the, the tunnel, so if you go and walk through the tunnel, um, depending on this time of the year, um, the water levels at different heights. Uh, when we got in, um, I think it came up to my mid, uh, mid thigh, and then it went down to my mid calf through most of it, walking through this cool water, spring water. Um, 800, 900 feet. So a football field is 300 feet, but it's, you're curving, you're walking, you're moving. I think it was 15 or 20 minute walk through. All right, and then it came out um, and then they, they cap it. They water's a precious resource in Israel. So they cap it and they, they'll use that. Um, but here is where it would have run into. It's the, um, this is the pool of Siloam. Maybe you recognize that from the New Testament. And so the waters would move. And that's where the guy, when the waters are disturbed, they get in because that's the spring that would gush. They would disturb the waters of the pool. The waterway would come into the pool. Uh, today, they've only excavated half because the other part is private property. Um, so that's kind of where it's at today. But the other thing that Hezekiah uh, said to have built, um, and this is uh, talked about in Chronicles, is a wall. And, and so um, this wall, it's not neat stones packed together. Um, Maybe it'll come here. There it is. Um, it's uh, kind of more rough stones. It's more broad. It's called the broad wall. Um, and you can kind of see up the, the markings going up the top of the side of the building there, um, about 18 feet. No, 18. Yeah, 18 feet. No, 24 feet. Sorry, eight meters, 24 feet high was this wall that Hezekiah had built and reinforced. So part of the wall was already in place, but part of it he reinforced as he knew the siege was coming. Um, so 24 feet high, uh, this wall that Hezekiah had built. Um, so you can see the steps over here on the side. I should give you a little bit of the scale of this. Um, and the top of it is at the, where the line is at the very top that's marking saying this was, and he, when he were in English that it's eight meters high. Um, so he built the wide wall to go up it they found it when there was like an earthquake or something and there was they were clearing rubble and like oh what's this because that's when they go and dig underneath stuff when a building comes down or construction or stuff like that and so they found this section of the broad wall uh, described in in, uh, in second kings or in uh, second chronicles uh, this is another portion of that just to the left of what i just showed you um, with this broad wall that Hezekiah built as part of the fortification. So uh, Hezekiah lived about 700 BC. We still have um, pieces of uh, archaeological evidence that are in line with what scripture describes in the midst of that. Okay. That's uh, so just a couple of those aside pieces. I, I love the history, the archaeology of some of that kind of stuff. It's, it's uh, pretty neat, pretty fascinating. Um, but just to, to get back to, to kind of the, the spiritual impact of this, so we talked a lot today about um, words, right? I asked you to have a, a saying or a thought at the beginning. Um, we heard about the, the words from Sennacherib's representative and how you can't trust the word of the Lord. Yet it's the word of the Lord that undoes Sennacherib, a rumor that gets him to move, a, a rumor or a, the word of God that comes and then the angel of the Lord that destroys um destroys his army and sends him back home and he's killed all in line with the word of the Lord. And so um, when we think about mere words and, and the trust we put in mere words, right? Uh, what mere words give us hope and comfort? That'll be something just to reflect on a little bit right now. The words that Jesus 
will never leave us or forsake us, that he's with us always, right? Those are just mere words. The mere words that he says, this is my body and blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Those are just mere words. But yet when God says them, because the God of the universe says them, that's what gives them their power. That's what gives them their authority. And so uh, it's been mere words that saved Hezekiah and it's mere words that save us today too. Uh, as we think about and unpack this section of scripture, uh, as God is, continues to be faithful, uh, even in the midst of unfaithful people in an unfaithful world. All right, any questions, comments, thoughts? All right, we've got two more weeks uh, of uh, Kings. Uh, next week, we'll get to Manasseh and Josiah. Um, and then the following week, we'll have the fall of Judah. And that will be where we close um, close at this point. So any other questions, comments, thoughts for today? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for mere words. Uh, mere words that give life and, and hope and healing because you are the one who has spoken them. I continue to, to watch over us, provide for us, uh, to remind us of your word. Give us your word through the pages of scripture, through other Christians, through our pastors and other teachers that, that point us to you. Lord, we thank you for your, for your love and your grace in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.